So before we actually roll it over to Jim and Jean to begin their discussion, I just wanted to welcome you today to the ONA highlight for August. With our guest presenters here from the Florida Cattlemen's Association, we are so glad that you guys could join us today. Now this webinar is being recorded and all of our webinars are available, the recordings are on our website in the virtual classroom. So don't worry if you have to leave early, you can finish watching later. Now, without further ado, I am gonna turn it over to Jim and Jean, and I will be seeing you guys later on. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Jean Lawless. Um, I'm currently your president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association. It is a great honor for me to be uh, serving you uh, this year. And uh, a little bit about myself, uh, I am a sixth generation uh, Florida boy. I grew up in Osceola County. Uh, grew up on uh, working on in orange groves and different uh, people that own cattle ranches in that area uh, from the time I was about uh, 13, 14 years old. Uh, so it's a great privilege to be able to serve as president and serve all the landowners and uh, ranchers uh, across the state of Florida. Um, and from there, I'd like to introduce you. I'm a graduate of University of Florida. Uh, got my BS degree in animal science. I have a master's degree in uh, business administration as well. Uh, I reside here at Archibald's Buck Island Ranch. Uh, I've been here for the last uh, 28 years. Uh, so again, it's a great pleasure uh, to be your president. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, executive board as well. Uh, President-elect is Mr. Cliff Coddington, uh, first vice president, uh, Wes Carlton, second vice president, uh, Pat Durden, our treasurer this year will be Dale Carlton, secretary is uh, Rick Moore, and of course our immediate past president, Mr. Matt Pierce. Uh, our Florida Beef uh, Council chairman is Mr. Flint Johns. Our Livestock Market Association representative is Mr. Rick Griner from North Florida. And our five district reps, uh, district one is Mr. Steve Yoder. Uh, district two is Lent Geralds. Uh, three is Jason Conrad, District Four is John Williamson, uh, District Five is Arnie Sarlo, and our at-large uh, representative, Mr. Fred Panizzi. Uh, and of course, I want to introduce our staff. And of course, we got Mr. Jim Hanley, our Executive Vice President, here with us. We have Dusty uh, Holly as our Field Representative Service and our Government Affairs, Mr. Sam Ard, and of course, we have our Water Environmental Manager who's contracted with the association since last year, Ms. Benita Whalen. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Hanley. Well, thank you very much, Gene. We really appreciate the opportunity and thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of the ONA webinar series. It gives us a good opportunity to, to speak a little bit about our, our organization, which is in its 86th year of existence. My name is Jim Hanley. I am the executive vice president of the Florida Cattlemen's Association. I reside in uh, South Orange County. Our state headquarters office is located in Kissimmee, Florida. It's been there since 1934 when the uh, association was established. I am home today. I am in Gene's office at Buck Island Ranch, which is situated in the south end of Highlands County. And that I'm a native of, of uh, Highlands County. And like Gene, I'm a sixth generation Floridian. I grew up in the community of Sebring. I have a uh, animal science degree from the University of Florida, just a few years ahead of Gene. And I'm in my 23rd year as working for the industry uh, in the capacity of the executive vice president for the association. A little bit about our organization, um, and it's kind of interesting if you look at some of the, the very reasons that a set of about 10 uh, ranchers got together uh, to work together, they felt like they could have more influence if they if they all worked uh, in unison and went to Tallahassee to work on things. But some of the very topics we continue to work on today were topics that brought them together, and it a lot of it is based on research and the fine work that that our friends at the University of Florida Institute of Food and Ag Sciences do at the various stations. Certainly, we're working with ONA today down here kind of in the heart of cow country, but each of the stations is real important to us. But research 
and understanding better nutrition and understanding better genetics was a big part of what they did. Certainly animal disease and disease management, uh, flood control, water issues, those continue to be front, front burner topics day in and day out for our organization. But our organization is structured in a manner that, that uh, is based on grassroots uh, control. The staff implements the plans and carries forward everything that uh, comes from our grassroots common member. And you don't have to own a cow to be a member of our organization. And you don't have to have a qualifying number of cows or acres to be a member. And you may have a thousand cows and you may have one cow, uh, but you still have same footing and same voting rights in our organization. We comprised of some 56 county organizations. They're, we, we refer to them as county affiliates. Um, our affiliates uh, are completely independent. They manage their affairs and their business as the people in those given counties determine how they want to. The qualifying event is, 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 is being a recognized to have an opportunity to have a board seat on our organization is they pay an annual assessment based on the beef cow numbers that the uh, the, the USDA National Ag Statistics Service tells us there are in that individual county. And in a few cases, we have some combined two county, three county, four county groupings uh, uh, that, are, that are clustered together uh, for their county organization. So we have the executive board that Gene mentioned to you and introduced the, the folks that are currently on that board. And then we have the, the big board, which is our board of directors, Gene will preside over that board. In his absence, the president-elect would preside, but that board has representation, the opportunity for every county to send a state director to, to bring the issues, if you will, from those individual counties to uh, the state level. We have a set of core committees, and those core committees focus on subject matter, uh, you know, in particular to that particular topic. We have a research committee, we have an environmental and private lands committee, we have an animal health committee, we have a marketing committee, we have a, an outstanding junior program, and they, there's a youth committee that oversees that. We have a legislative committee. Oh, heck, I'm forgetting some, but uh, uh, anyway, those core committees determine the, the direction and policy and the focus areas on which we're going to 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 really give our time to. But uh, if it is, a, if it is a, a topic at the state or federal level that affects land, land use, livestock, the movement of livestock, um, uh, we are engaged in attempting to maintain a business environment in which our ranchers can continue to ranch and find profitability here in the state of Florida. As a state organization, we are an affiliate, a state affiliate of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. And through them, we work closely and lobby. They maintain a presence. They have a building and the, their main operation, their headquarters are in Denver, Colorado. And they have a, 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 a nice big office and an outstanding lobbying staff uh, in Washington, DC. And we work with them and our role, Dusty and I's role primarily is to be a liaison between our producers and what's happening in Washington, and then in turn our, our elected delegation, uh, our members of, of the Senate and, and, con and in Congress, um, and, and we try to influence the outcome of, of what they bring forward. At the state level, we work with Sam Ard. Sam's been on board an equal number of years as I. He's in his 23rd year, and Sam is contract lobbyist. He has more than one client, but Sam works to represent us on a variety of issues uh, at the state level. Certainly, what since we're with IFAS today, certainly funding and adequate funding for IFAS, uh, the land grant mission, is always a priority in our wish list, if you will, of topics that we focus on when we go to the Capitol and try to try to uh, help the decision makers understand who we are and what we do. Uh, most, I think the audience here probably has bet a good understanding of, of our association, but uh, it is grassroots driven. Um, uh, I, I, I would, we're not hugely sophisticated, but we are very active and engaged in a lot of different agencies. Um, 
you name it, and we try to have far-reaching tentacles. And I will say that we work with our friends in all the other ag commodities in the state. Most of our ranches are diversified and have citrus and 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 or or have another crop, you know, citrus or cane or row crops or or nursery or turf or timber, uh, you name it, depending on where you are. And so if it helps the timber man, it generally helps the rancher. If it helps the citrus man, it generally helps the rancher. So we work kind of in lockstep with those other organizations, Florida Farm Bureau, all of them uh, closely because because everybody uh, at the end of the day uh, wins. If if a topic they're pushing, we're pushing. We everybody. It's 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 a favorable outcome for all. Gene, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to just throw in right there, Jim. Is you know, each year a president has a theme, and and this year our theme is going to be uh, hashtag Open Gates, Open Minds. So that ties right into that uh, with our ability to work with all the other ag ag groups across the state is that you know we feel that we understand that agriculture has complex systems so you know, opening gates opening minds you know today we have 22 and a half million people that live in the state of florida uh, normal years 125 million visitors so there's a lot of folks coming to florida today that you know don't quite understand that agriculture is a big impact you know has as much big impact different. Mm -hmm. uh, footprint, as Jim points out, to the state of Florida. Uh, you know, if we look behind tourism, agriculture is there. So I believe, you know, we have an opportunity here to really bring back agriculture to the forefront. Uh, we could see some of that during a shutdown. Uh, you know, we shut that, you know, the state got shut down, food distribution and things. So I think it, with the university and ourselves working together, all the other ag commodities, in uh, working with the different state agencies, uh, we have an opportunity here to really uh, bring agriculture back to the forefront. Gene mentioned uh, a, a young lady that's working with us now, uh, again, on a contract basis, Benita Whalen, and she's uh, primarily on board. She's an engineer, but she's on board to help us with our liaison work and monitoring and communicating with the water management districts and uh, uh, we've spent a great deal of time during Matt Pierce's presidency uh, uh, working with and, and, and doing a lot of outreach to the staff and the uh, appointed board members uh, of the water, in this case, in the South Florida Water Management District, trying to get them on some ranches to get them really out here in the country to see what we do and how we manage the land. It, it's, it's, uh, we, we've, uh, Traditionally, we're a pretty humble industry, and traditionally, we've been we're not real good at, at waving the flag and bragging. And while the gates haven't been locked, we've we probably haven't stepped out the front gate and waved people in. So we're trying to change that and be more proactive and aggressive, and, and really getting it on calendars. There's not a rancher in the state of Florida, I dare say, that won't would not allow you to come. They just are so busy and have their head down that they just don't think to engage and get people to come. And we're trying to change that to help them understand the decisions they're making and how it might affect us. We, we think we're a vital part of taking care of the environment in the state, taking care of cleaning the water up, storing the water, producing air, um, uh, the green space, the incredible wildlife, uh, the endangered species, the unique habitats, but a lot of people don't realize that. and. Uh, and sometimes the decisions they make are detrimental and put restrictions on our land use and put economic burdens on our land use. And, and, and the ultimate product is uh, guys getting so, so, so uh, in such a tight situation that they have to shake their head. Yes. To the, to uh, what our friend, Mr. Sonny Williamson has often said, the final crop, which is asphalt and concrete and housing and subdivisions. So we have a, a very aggressive uh, a position trying to uh, help people understand. Another big topic we've been working on is the water quality BMPs, the best management practices for nutrient management on cow-calf operations. And I'm proud to say that the, the, the Florida Cattlemen's Association, and this predates me, they were working on creating the first uh, BMP manual for, for, for nutrient management. And we are in a position now where it is being rewritten and uh, they have expanded the Office of Ag Water Policy and have a little some more manpower 
and they're ratcheting up, especially in the in the areas where there's BMAPs, Basin Basin Management Action Plans. They're focused on trying to, uh, on a voluntary basis, trying to get um, landowners to to uh, uh, sign the notice of intent and implement BMPs. And so that's something we have been trying to work with the Office of Ag Water Policy and make sure the language was un is understood and that it doesn't uh, cause uh, complications or or something is misinterpreted um, or could be misinterpreted in the future that would be a huge economic burden. So that's something we've been promoting and we've been working on is the rewrite of the BMPs. And we are indeed trying to educate landowners, members or not, that uh, that uh, the BMPs are out there and they might want to give consideration to voluntarily signing up and working with the FDAC's uh, Office of Black Water Policy team uh, as, as, as you know to be responsible stewards and manage their nutrients. That it's not a it's not a requirement. It's not a law. It's an individual case by case personal decision. But we're trying to educate people so they can make that decision with information and not be blindsided uh, when something else happens or DEP comes in and says, well, you have to start putting in a, a water monitoring program. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to re emphasize that importantly. It's still uh, an individual's choice. Uh, but as Mr. Hanley pointed out, uh, the Florida Cattlemen's Association has been working on water issues since the inception of, since 1934. Uh, so as we all know, this the legislation this last year have passed some uh, very important legislation, the Senate Bill 712 and uh, House Bill 503. Those are things dealing with water, water quality issues. Um, so, you know, there's five water management districts across the state and uh, these BMPs are gonna be, uh, need to be implemented across the entire state. Uh, the association at this point has focused on the South Florida Water Management District uh, because they, we all see on the news a uh, year or two ago, uh, there's blue green algae and this, that, and the other. And uh, South Florida Water Management District happens to be the largest water management district that services about 51 to 52 percent of the population of the state. Uh, with that, in the 22 years that we have been looking at, you know, the BMPs, Mr. Hanley mentioned, is we have we're we're trying to inform all ranchers and landowners that uh, this will be, this is your option. There are other alternatives, but what we know about the water issues uh, and the water regulations and laws on the books, this will be a better option for a landowner to take. So that's why we've kind of stayed with the BMPs. They're, they're written by cattle ranchers and, and landowners, uh, and it gives you that presumption of compliance. It gives you that, that little bit of uh, security that we are following the laws and regulations on the books by doing these BMPs. Shifting gears a little bit, as everybody knows, we've all been experiencing uh, life with COVID and, uh, and, and it's really put some strain on everybody. It's certainly put strain and stress on our industry, uh, a great deal of economic pressure, um, no doubt. Uh, uh, as far as our little organization, we have had we had to conduct our we had to cancel our annual convention, which is a huge, huge 17, 1800 person gathering with our allied members. And then and we have a big trade show and a large number of business meetings. But it's a great opportunity to start the summer. But we had to cancel it because of this. And so we had to conduct our business uh, in a different manner. And we've done it just like this uh, over the Internet. And we had very successful meetings. We got our business taken care of. Matt Pierce's leadership was wonderful through it. We did lose the opportunity to do some things in person, but we've moving forward through it. But with COVID kicking in, uh, one of the first things that we did as an association, uh, I asked actually one of IFAS's people, uh, Chris Pravat there, who's, a, who's an economist. Uh, um, and those of you that read our magazine on a monthly basis, he, he, he provides us with an article as do quite a few members through the IFA system. Uh, but anyway, I asked Dr. Chris Pravat to put together an economic analysis of, of the anticipated 
uh, uh, impact of this situation as the market changed dramatically. Gene mentioned the food system. He mentioned uh, the, 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 the problem with the disease. It backed up and caused a, a great reduction in the efficiency in our capacity at our packing plants. And the packing plants no longer were pushing product and packing product to go into the food service sector, but rather had to shift over, change their cuts and change their lines to start packing a larger percentage of it to go to retail. And that doesn't just happen overnight. Then you combine that with some illness running through their manpower and the fact that they had to spread their people out in their processing plants. They were running with, with short team, short, shorter teams, uh, longer turnover uh, from, from one shift to the next, and they just slowed their lines down. And we suffered a dramatic backup, if you will. The, they suggested a million head of ready cattle, ready to be processed, to go to, to the processing plants that were backed up. So that's turned our supply and demand system upside down. It really kind of brought a tremendous amount of volatility to the market. So we combined our efforts with NCBA, and they, they commissioned a economic analysis study utilizing input from people like uh, in Florida, Prabat, and others all over the country to put together a big economic impact study and carried that to Congress to lobby for some programs. We, we pursued making sure ag operations were eligible for the PPP loans. We pursued uh, funding into the, into the CFAP program. And if you haven't signed up, I encourage you to visit the Farm Service Agency office and sign up for that program. It's not perfect, but there, there certainly is a program there to help you some as a livestock producer get you through this, this, this uh, difficult period. Um, we, we work to get extended uh, hours of uh, service for our trucks. We uh, had some weight waivers uh, placed to, so we could load trucks a little bit heavier because we were concerned there would be fewer trucks available and we need to get cattle moved. That's something we, we've done oftentimes uh, through the Department of Agriculture, especially in windows of when we've had bad fires or in particular, really bad wet hurricanes and like ranches like this where their calf crop and their cow herd is in standing water and we need to get them moved because the cattle are, are shrinking, backing up, losing weight and it's costing us money. We, we, we've, we've been able to achieve getting some weight restrictions uh, uh, waived, and we are able to get the cattle out of here more quickly, um, load trucks heavier and get them moved, and it saves us some money. But we've worked on that at, at the federal level with NCBA, and I don't know how many different letters we signed on, but, but we definitely si uh, uh, worked with them to pursue uh, the USDA in their uh, expanding their uh, investigation of the volatility in the marketplace. Um, we all know when the packers capacity changed uh, and there's huge amount of volatility in the market and price and yoke prices were yo-yoing, certainly the the price at retail when it went extremely high, box beef was extremely high, but what they were paying for fat cattle wasn't very high and people were suffering. And so they were already conducting a investigation on the market reaction to the fire that occurred at a at a packing plant in Holcomb, Kansas a year ago in uh, a year ago August and so we asked them to combine it to this uh, second black swan event in the COVID-19 and the way it affected the market and asked them if uh, if they would also include the Department of Justice if indeed they saw any signs of potential fraud or collusion or price fixing in the marketplace the jury's out as to if they'll find anything, but we certainly asked them to do do that. At the same time, we asked the administration to implement under the War Powers Act that this essential business needed to stay operational so we could continue to provide protein across the country. And so they implemented uh, everything they could to keep the inspectors on the job and those plants operating as best they could. They are back to, I think at the weakest they were maybe at 60, 65% of their packing capacity, and they're back uh, 95, 98% of, 
I believe in most most uh, instances uh, at full capacity. So that is helping us get through this backlog of cattle that is that is backed up in in feed country. Um, there's a lot of other steps that we took uh, during this COVID situation, and we continue to work to uh, finalize some trade agreements. Uh, we were getting lined up with, but prior to COVID, we thought we were going to have an extremely fine market because of the the, the trade agreements that had been reworked and, and negotiated. But time will tell how how those kick back in as we work through this this big backlog of cattle. Hey, we have a question. Okay. All right. This crest question is from Chris Moran. He Chris says. Moran. When you have when you mention the bottleneck at the packing plants, it looks like the Florida cattle industry is terribly vulnerable to disruptions beyond its control. Is there any thought on how to mitigate that so that the next time there's a pandemic, the industry is better protected? There's well, a world of thoughts. There's a world of thoughts, but let's look at our production system. And uh, if you take our state of Florida, and you look at when we supply 650, 700,000 head of calves to, calf. to feeder calves to the system. So it's a timing of it and your timing issue. You know, we all know there's three major packers, uh, four major packers that are harvesting 75 to 80% of the cattle in the United States. Uh, so it's, it's just a timing issue that happens. And when the bottleneck hits, you know, if those cattle, we were seeing, as Jim mentioned a second ago, you see those cattle, they were moving. We saw prices starting to hedge up. I think if you'll look back a year ago and you look at uh, Chris Bravat's uh, uh, market analysis each month, he showed this a year to two years ago. 2020, we'd start hedging up. 2021, we're going to hedge up again. It's the natural cycle of uh, the economics of this thing. So as we get through this, it's, it's a tough situation. Uh, to maneuver that it, it, it is a, a given we have a a, uh, a shortage of packing capacity and not a lot of margin for error in our industry nationwide that's no doubt some of that came about with the implementation of of HACCP requirements on kill plants uh, hazard analysis critical control points whereby some of those plants would have had to invest a great deal of money to modify their 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 physical plants and how they do things and they just did it and it drove some of them out of business or restricted how they could do business there are certainly some uh programs through the usda and other things in the works that we hope will allow for more local processors to come back online and to come back into existence. One thing that we did discover during this uh, this changeover and people having to stay home and cook is there's a lot of demand to buy direct from the farmer. Uh, but the processing plant, you have to have the perfect situation to sell individual retail cuts. You can sell an individual whole animal or a half of an animal and get it custom processed. But there certainly is a challenge for us to to get everything processed. I doubt that we would ever convert the entire Florida industry to remain in Florida. We don't grow enough grain here to f properly finish cattle. Our climate's not real conducive uh, for cattle to be as comfortable as possible. We, but we're a grain deficit and we are packing have a packing shortage. Um, we there, there are a few things on the horizon that we might see some expansion of some packing. Uh, and there's certainly uh, interest, and we created a list. If you've been to our website, we created a list of of farmers and ranchers that that have an interest in our 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 uh, participating in selling local beef, farm to farm to re excuse me farm to individuals, not farm to retail, but farm to individuals. And uh, we're hearing reports of various degrees of success, but people. Uh, it made them comfortable to do business with the farmer, if you will. And uh, so people are trying to develop systems to to uh, to address that. But it is a 
Chris, it's a it's a it's a long term challenging question, and we are certainly vulnerable uh, to to hiccups in the in the when the when the when the, the supply chain shifts and changes. It is certainly uh, a huge challenge, no doubt about it. Something else I wanted to mention, and it's not really in in in, in uh, uh, related to COVID or or anything, but to something we've been working on, and just yesterday sent a final reminder to our our uh, county presidents and state directors. But we have the opportunity to weigh in to the uh, the federal dietary guidelines, and and uh, this is not something new, but I think it's every five years they update the dietary guidelines, the recommendations on which institutions and, and medical professionals and, and, um, and, and diet and nutrition professionals that they reference in, in, in uh, suggesting uh, proper diets. And so we are trying to make sure, sure through our uh, nutritionists and certainly through our state organizations, um, the importance of maintaining our protein as a part of the recommendation in the in the dietary guidelines at the federal level, so we have been weighing in with comments, uh, well, aggressively to try to make sure we are kept on there, and that the guidelines are developed based on science and fact, and not other motivations that might want to bump us off off of the suggested. Uh, nutritional programs. I understand Dr. Angle's on. We want to welcome him. Dr. Scott Angle is, uh, has just recently started in the month of July with the University of Florida as the vice president for the instant for 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 all of UF IFAS, which is a huge huge opportunity for him and very important to us. I mean, we're talking to the animal science group today kind of through through uh through ona but all you think about soils you think about forages you think about heck hum, human nutrition we think about employees we think about uh, uh ag educators uh, engineers uh, uh, everything they do uh, touches and affects us and we just welcome him on board and look forward to to getting him to come get to know our industry and see some of our beautiful ranches it's kind of a hidden industry we also are going to be welcoming welcoming soon uh, in person. We hope uh, a new state conservationist and, and uh, Mr. Juan Hernandez, who's come on board to oversee uh, the USDA NRCS. He, he's officed in Gainesville, but we're looking forward to working with him as well. Um, recently, a few of us attended a, uh, the midsummer meeting in Denver, and that's where all the the states come together and uh, and participate in committee meetings, and we had an outstanding offering of a updated long-range plan for the industry, and it's a very well done, comprehensive uh, analysis of areas of focus to try to keep the uh, industry uh, sustainable long-term and to keep the industry advancing. There's a tremendous amount of science in uh, beef production uh and and uh the long range plan is a very good piece you'll be seeing more and more uh, about it as we launch it make it available on our website things like that we had an individual producer we had a, one of our past presidents mr ken griner that served on that long range plan review and development committee and uh and they did a, an outstanding job um i've looked at the plan and it's and it speaks to increasing uh packing capacity as one of their primary objective how they're going to get that done the the, the jury's out but it they it, it is addressed there um uh for us to be be sustainable we've got to expand capacity and diversify the industry some some more I'm trying to see what topic we will so just know that i mean our our association is is highly involved with with our national uh, our, our national cattlemen's as well. Uh, I mean, addressing all the issues that that come up 
And, and as Jim mentioned earlier, that, earlier that uh, you know the Cattlemen's Association represents all producers, whether you're big, smaller. Uh, the most important thing is is for everybody to to uh, show up and participate. Uh, you know that's the that's the biggest thing, and never give up in participation. Uh, you know a lot lot goes on at our meetings and things, and uh, you know in the 28 years that I've been involved with the association. Uh, I have never not been heard. Uh, there's been occasion that uh, the answers that I received, uh, I might not have liked, but the one thing you must be is persistent and keep getting up and, and showing up and participating. That's the process. Uh, as Jim mentioned, you know, we attended uh, uh, some attended in person. I actually was on the Zoom call and uh, watched our process at work. You, you've seen, we went through the livestock marketing uh, committee had a lot of actually a very lively six hour meeting six hour debate uh, six hour debate on coming through and working through the process and what you've seen you've seen two two sides uh that were very opposed on price discovery was on, the topic on on price discovery and on that price discovery what, what it showed though at the end of the day they agreed to disagree but they compromised and came back together and that's our process: is to agree to disagree, but always walk walk away with a consolidated agreement. And that's what we do, and try to do in everything that we do at, at the state level. Uh, we look for input from all the county organizations, uh, and and we we work for y'all. And, and that's what we uh, why we are here. Something that we're uh, we had shifting gears just a bit. Something that we're working on that you all might hear more about. We've certainly been working on it for a number of years, but that is uh, uh, for disease management, um, electronic identification is going to come to our industry. Certainly uh, the technology is advancing and there's a, a, a lot more options out there today. And we're one of three or four states that uh, applied to, to the USDA and received a grant to to advance a pilot project on on animal identification, electronic animal identification. So we are well underway in doing that. We had three sources of funding for our pilot project. Uh, the first was uh, was our cattle enhancement board. Secondly was the uh, Florida Cattlemen's Foundation, and then the third third portion. A big portion was through this USDA grant, but through the cooperation of some of our livestock markets, the Arcadia Stockyard, the Ocala Stockyard, um, and just re recently the Sumter County Farmers Market at Webster, all three of them have put in uh, readers and systems to read various tags and are working with us to read tags. We are also working in a cooperative manner with Texas and Kansas and tracking cattle that leave here. I actually early this morning was helping one of our producers or with his crew uh, sort and weigh up some calves that are tagged electronically that are destined for for uh, uh, North Texas, the uh, Texas Panhandle, and some may go to Colorado and, and we're communicating with them and they will read the tags from South Florida when they hit, say, Amarillo, Texas, and we'll know the retention rate of those tags and we'll know the readability of those tags. We're also working with uh, with Quincy Cattle Company in Chiefland and some others. I, 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 I'm remiss in, in not bringing up everybody, but the point is we're trying to understand the various technologies and make sure we know what we think might be best for us to continue to move cattle at the normal speed of commerce. A byproduct of some of, some of this electronic reading will be inventory management for an individual operation or collecting data. We have engaged uh, Dr. John Arthington and Dr. Todd Thrift and other members of the, of the animal science department team to help us do the statistical analysis of these readings. And, you know, we think that we're gonna have a pretty good outcome looking at uh, both, both ultra high frequency and low frequency tags. Uh, I was last week at the Sumter County Market and they tag, it's a little unique, they tag every animal that, that producers bring to their barn and they utilize that to track the cattle through their, their barn and, and as they ship out. And so for them, it's going to be a real useful tool in their clerking and just in their 
their pure inventory management utilizing a, a ultra high frequency a back tag, which is something real new, but we think it's going to work for them in, in a good manner. We're also hoping to work with some cooperating packers to, to follow some cattle direct from ranch or dairy to the processing plant and terminate those tags um, uh, to understand how that would work. Uh, nothing about what we're doing is mandatory. Nothing about what we're doing has changed any laws. Nothing about what we're doing is is uh, is bringing economic burden on anybody. It's just a learning process to understand what's out there. So when when uh, and we're one of the few countries that don't don't have uh, electronic ID system on our entire herd. But when that comes forward, we will certainly know more, and it will have been tested by actual producers that are doing business day in and day out. So we'll know how to react and respond and make a recommendation, if you will, to the USDA um, on what we think will function or won't function right. in our industry. Yeah, and as Mr. Andy points out, you know, traceability is another part of those thoughts. You know, if we can trace these animals in a, in a shutdown situation, uh, perhaps we can keep cattle it moving and in commerce. You know, a few years back, if you look at a state like Michigan uh, with TB and, and the dairy cattle up there, uh, they mandated traceability in Michigan years ago, but that was in order to get a handle of, of a disease situation, but also keep the beef cattle in commerce, not just shutting down the whole system within that state. So uh, traceability is very important for our, for our industry. Um, and other, and then another prime factor is, is you know, it's kind of like a VIN number. It gives you that proof, uh, that little 15-digit uh, uh, number, kind of gives you that ownership. The VIN number it tells you that animal belongs to you, and in hopes that uh, you know you can pass that along through the system. Uh, Just like Chris's question about our vulnerability for packing capacity uh, in a pandemic, um, we are extremely uh, vulnerable uh with the the wrong animal disease as an industry in that it might shut us down moving cattle uh and 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 that doesn't work we have to keep our channels of traffic and trade and commerce open and so uh working with our state veterinarians and the animal health officials to keep uh our state lines open certainly in a state like ours where we basically uh, uh everything 700 750,000 Head of calves a year or shipped out of here um, on on truckloads, and to think if they were to quarantine our state because of some animal disease. I mean, we had a scare when that screw worm fly showed up in key, in the Keys a couple of years ago. Um, states, their prerogative, they could say, "Whoa, we don't want any livestock from that particular state," and so we want to be prepared so that we can continue to move cattle and move livestock. That leads me to think about uh, the beef quality assurance programs that uh, that we have promoted both as a Cattlemen's Association but also from our, our state beef councils. BQA is real important uh, for our, 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 land, our cattle owners to embrace to, to make sure they're following best management practices as it relates to beef quality assurance, proper administration of vaccines, proper record keeping, proper animal care and well-being. But an exciting thing, our BQA, our national BQA program, just last week or in the last two, three weeks, uh, gained accreditation, if you will, uh, that it meets uh, 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 in the World Health Organization ISO standards, which, what's that mean? It means that uh, it, is, it is verified uh, as credible, and as a thorough program, and it really helps us when we start talking about trade negotiations with other countries and we want our product to, to we want to access other markets. So it's kind of a big deal. And it was a three, three plus year process to meet ISO standards with our BQA program. And we have achieved that, which is, which is a, a, a big deal. Um, um, in the in the animal health world, if you will, so it's something we're excited about. For everybody that's on, I'd like to encourage uh, you all to to type in uh, United We Stake, 
and look at some of the social media that's happening. Uh, we're taking part in it as a, as a state of Florida, uh, utilizing beef producers checkoff dollars, but it's a tremendously successful uh, program that was launched uh, right in the latter part of July, and it's uh, getting tremendous uh, pickup and coverage and, and promoting of the consumption of beef and a lot of different recipe ideas. But if you type in United We Steak, uh, it'll bring you a great deal of information, um, um, fun information and positive messages about beef and beef consumption and nutrition and, and diet. Uh, it's just something that's kind of exciting. On top of that is another, uh, and Dr. Angle is working on a, a huge project with a huge gift from the, that, was, that came to the University of Florida on uh, uh, artificial intelligence and how we can utilize the development of artificial intelligence tools uh, in, in the advancement of agriculture. But um, in the case of, of, uh, of the beef industry, there is an artificial intelligence tool called Chuck Knows Beef, and it's designed to help individual consumers um, um, find out everything and you can type in Chuck News Beef and learn how to cook a pot roast this evening or or whatever. It's kind of exciting. Uh, cool. for the yep. I think our time, oh, gentlemen, time has flown by and our, we are at our end and we have a few um, comments and things to mention from the questions before we go. Um, Dr. Angle mentioned that he was glad to join you today, and he is looking forward to supporting your important industry. And then Dusty Hawley wanted to mention that in regard to the dietary, um, in regard to the dietary guidelines that you had mentioned earlier, that if you go to your Facebook page, that there is a questionnaire, there's a link to a form that folks can provide comments on that. And I think there's a timeline on it. It says you have less than a week to submit your comments. So if anybody would like to provide input on that, the dietary guidelines, please check out your website, your own Facebook page. Okay, no, don't, I'm not asking you to. <laughs> And please, okay. they want they want producers to weigh in. If anybody's on here and has the time, please, it's to, it's a three click process, if you can. Okay. And then we had one last question from Dan Kesey. He asks if Mr. Lawless could talk a little bit about Buck Island's relationship to Archibald. Okay. Uh, so Archibald Biological Station or Archibald Expedition is our I call it our mothership or our parent company. And then uh, 30 years ago, Archibald leased Buck Island Ranch from the John D. MacArthur Foundation. And uh, our lease run out in 2018. Uh, and so our board of directors at Archibald has decided we purchased the ranch actually from the MacArthur Foundation in 2018. Uh, so our relationship is, is uh, they work on the pristine Lake Wells Ridge, and then we're the ranch off the edge of the ridge. Um, so what we do here is we do a lot of agroecology research. We look at water, water quality, uh, you know, all the different functions of our agriculture operations on the natural environment. So that's our, how we tie with Archibald. But it is, I will just reiterate, that is a 10,000, 11,000 acre ranch uh, that is stocked, uh, uh, like any other commercial ranch and and gene uh um the, his arms twisted behind his back to to make the cows maintain a profitability and carry themselves the ranching operation is not subsidized from the science side i guess i would say the frust the potential frustration for gene and and his crew that manage the cow herd and the ranching operation is they have to deal with a lot 40 or 50 scientists and all kind of interns in and out, in and out of the pastures all day, every day. It's part of what they do. They've come to 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 make it work. But I'm just saying, it is a it is a going a commercial ranch run just like anybody else's. But they're under the microscope, if you will, of 40 or 50 scientists on a continuous basis. It's been it's uh, it's it's really helped us educate 
the non-ranching community and a lot of scientists to understand the complexities of ranching, the economic challenges, the environmental changes and challenges that you have to work with Mother Nature. And it's been a real, to me, it's a, it, it's kind of a, a hidden gem, a real gold mine of information. But it, he has the challenges just like everybody else's ranch, um, trying to make it, to make it work and make it stay in the, in the black, if you will, on the, on the financial ledger. Um, this is home to me when I was a kid, a little old kid. Uh, this ranch was owned by the MacArthur family, John D. MacArthur and. I, my dad happened to be a veterinarian in this area, and he did the vet work here. So I got my show calves for the Highlands County Fair from Buck Island Ranch. That's cool. So I, and oh. my closing is I just offer that uh, anybody ever wants to reach out to us. I mean, Jim's doors open 24 hours a day. Our phones are on. Uh, you know, we're here to work for, for, the, for our members, each and every one of you. And uh, we thank you for this opportunity today. And sorry, it's not, uh, maybe it's been spit and sputter with the connection, uh, but we I thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you, glad you guys could be a part of it. And whenever you registered for this event, we have your email. And as I mentioned at the beginning, everything is recorded. And within about a day and a half, I will get back to you at your email address with a link so you can check out this program again if you'd like, as well as Jim and Jean's contact information in case you need to reach out to them anytime in the future. And before we go, just wanted to share with you our webinar for next month, September the 8th at 11 a.m. That will be an ONA highlight with guest presenter Dr. Mario Benelli, and he will be presenting reproductive management strategies for Florida beef cattle. And then we also have a few more programs coming up. Also this evening, there's gonna be a herd health seminar and you see the information, the flyer should be showing now. And the link to register for that can be found on our website, which I'm gonna share in my last slide. So this is an opportunity for tonight to hear Dr. Philippe Moriel and Dr. Joe Bittar. Also this evening, there's going to be a beef cattle management series, um, culling the herd, body condition scoring, and cattle nutrition offered by the Central Florida Livestock Agents Group. Then September 17th, there's going to be an equine institute offered by the Sea Flag Group. And that's gonna be an all day program and here on our last slide, I have our website address, how you can find us on social media, and our email address. If you're not already signed up to get our weekly news blast, just send me an email at that address and we'll get you signed up. So every Friday, you'll get um, the latest news, what's happening, any kind of event reminders for things coming up, and then a full view of the calendar at the bottom of that email that shows events coming up for the foreseeable future that we know about to share with you. And again, um, all those events now for the foreseeable future, these are gonna be online. And um, we're so glad we're able to reach out to you guys even if we can't be there in person. So that is it for today's program. Again, thank you, Jim and Jean. Thank you. Thank you all.